<laughs> Thank you for joining Mayor Brown's Technology Transactions webinar. Our program today will focus on how robotic process automation and artificial intelligence are changing outsourcing in the consumer financial services industry. I will go over a couple of administrative matters before we get started with the program. First, at the bottom of your screen, there are multiple application widgets that you can use. All of these widgets are resizable and movable, so you can move them around on your desktop. You also can expand your slide area to maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. This webinar is being streamed so through your computer, so there's no dial-in number, which you should already know if you can hear me speaking. For the best audio quality, please be sure that your computer, your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. Uh, for best viewing, we recommend using a wired internet connection, preferably with Chrome or Firefox browsers, and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so we recommend logging off your VPN. If your slides are behind, you can push F5 on your keyboard to refresh the page. Also, there's a help widget at the bottom of your screen which provides answers to the most common technical questions. A couple of notes for, for folks who are seeking CLE credit. During, the, during today's presentation, we'll provide an alphanumeric code. If, you're, if you are applying for CLE, you'll need to record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that you receive by email with the connection details. You can also find a copy of the virtual sign-in sheet on the resource list widget labeled CLE Affirmation Form. Directions for returning the CLE Affirmation Form are on that sheet, and we will read the code in the middle of the presentation, as I mentioned, and then again at the end. Uh, please note that we made the event evaluation form and presentation deck available in the resource list for your convenience. This webinar is being recorded, and in a day or so, we will be sending you an email with a link, which you can use to listen to the webinar again or share with your colleagues. The recording will also be posted on our website. We plan to allow time at the end of the program for questions. If you want to submit a question electronically, please use the Q&A widget on your screen. And if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will make sure that we follow up with you after um, to address things that we didn't have time to cover. Okay, a couple of quick introductions. First of all, my name is Melanie Brody, and I am delighted to participate in this webinar with my colleagues, Rebecca Eisner and Joe Pennell. Uh, I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a member of our Consumer Financial Services Group. Rebecca is a partner in the technology transactions practice in the Chicago office of Mayor Brown, where she also serves as our partner in charge of the Chicago office. Rebecca's practice focuses on data, digital, outsourcing, and software and systems technology transactions, privacy, and security. Joe Pennell is a partner in the techno technology transactions and corporate and securities practices. He focuses his, his practice on digital and outsourced service transactions, including fintech, cloud computing, software licensing and implementation, and um, other issues. We're going to give a couple quick notes on um, two of our relevant practice groups before we jump into the content. Um, first of all, the Consumer Financial Services practice group, um, which is primarily based in our DC office. Office is one of the leading financial services practices in the United States. We have more than 30 lawyers focusing on financial services providers um, in the regulatory, transactional, enforcement, and litigation spaces. And Joe, I'll come to you for technology transactions. Thanks, Melanie. So really quickly about our technology transactions practice group at Mayor Brown. We have 50 lawyers worldwide who've done over $200 billion of data, digital, outsourcing, and software transactions. So very relevant to today's conversation. So our discussion today will cover four key topics. First, we're going to talk about what robotic process automation, or RPA, and artificial intelligence actually are, 
and give some examples of how they're used in practice. Then we're going to talk about the trend for adoption of these technologies and how they're being used in the financial services industry today. Third, we'll talk about the challenges in applying current legal constructs to RPA and AI. And finally, and very importantly, what do these technologies mean in terms of your technology service provider contracts? How do you contract for RPA and AI in your vendor agreements? And how is it different from how you're currently contracting? So first, what's robotic process automation or RPA? RPA uses software to partially or fully automate human activities that are manual, repetitive, and rule-based. Obviously, this can reduce costs, but it can also improve accuracy and cycle times because RPA can run 24-7 and can be rapidly scaled up. One of the powerful advantages of RPA in particular is that it can work with your existing systems. It, in effect, operates as a replacement for a human user. It can operate at the presentation layer. So what does that mean? It means that implementing RPA doesn't require a company to incur great expense or alter its existing infrastructure and systems. So what's a real-world uh, application of RPA that we've seen from our clients? So in this first example, it was a construction engineering business that had to send hundreds of invoices per month to customers. Now, collecting these invoices involved hundreds of pages of supporting data from dozens of different systems, and it involved pasting details on project progress, providing time detail, invoices from third parties, verifications, acceptance certificates, releases, and those sorts of things. And this effort actually took the company about five hours for each customer invoice. And the company now says it only takes 11 minutes for each invoice using software robots to perform these functions. As you can imagine, the shift from a five-hour process to an 11-minute process involves millions of dollars in savings, not to mention the increased accuracy associated with using those software robots. Um, here's another example from the financial services industry. A bank had 11 employees assigned to monitor about 2,500 very high-risk customer accounts to determine whether payment demand should be processed or returned. Now that the work is done, by a 20, is done by 20 bots, those 11 employees are left to do more interesting and higher value work. Um, one estimate right now in the industry is that RPA could only automate in the range of 20 to 40% of basic transactional functions, but that's going to increase rapidly over the next few years, we think. Finally, just a handful of other benefits of RPA. One, increased security. Um, as those on the webinar probably have heard before, humans are often the weakest security link in any process, so eliminating the hum human role from certain processes may reduce risk to your clients. Uh, two, the potential to localize activities that you used to perform offshore with similar cost savings. This may be better optics than traditional offshore outsourcing, and it may also help you deal with data localization requirements in China and Russia or help you avoid the complexity of some cross-border data transfer issues under GDPR in the EU. Now I'll hand it over to Rebecca to deconstruct AI for us. Thanks, Joe. So um, taking a look at this picture, we're going to break it down a little bit and talk about the components of AI and what it is. Artificial intelligence really has been around for a while, but it's been made more prominent and it's progressing more quickly because of vast processing power, cloud computing, big data, and improved algorithms. And artificial intelligence at the highest level starts with a machine learning from data, um, somewhat in the same way that a child learns. The machines learn by being fed structured or unstructured data. They then recognize patterns, they create rules, they find correlations. And deep learning, which is the next level down, involves teaching computers to think more like humans. And they do that through things like image recognition and natural language processing. So AI is a general name given to these different ranges of machine learning algorithms. And the two most common are supervised and unsupervised learning. And on our next slides, we're going to talk a little bit at, about and look at examples of those. So why don't we talk about supervised machine learning and how it works. This chart is an example of supervised machine learning. And it starts with 
programming an algorithm or programming a machine with certain categories or labels and then feeding data into the machine such that the machine starts to recognize and group uh, similar groups of whatever the item is that you're trying to categorize. In this case, our example is cats and not cats or dogs. Um, the, the intent is to get the machine to recognize the patterns and the correlations from the data and begin, begin to be able to recognize cats versus dogs. So again, supervised machine learning involves pre-programming an algorithm to start to discover certain correlations and patterns in the data so that it can begin to label the data that it is processing. So by contrast, let's look at unsupervised machine learning and how that works. In unsupervised machine learning, you do not do the programming that I mentioned that exists with supervised machine learning. You will take large categories of data, feed them into the machine, and let the machine itself start to assemble the patterns and correlations that it sees. And from that, the machine will start to create the algorithms that will ultimately lead to the way that the machine categorizes and recognizes the data. And so in this case, we start feeding all of the data into the machine. The machine observes and learns from the data and starts to recognize that there are similarities between um, those animals that are in group one being cats and those that are in group two being dogs. So that's obviously a very high level and simplified description of artificial intelligence, but some of these themes will come back later in our presentation as we talk about how to work through them in contracting. Joe? Thanks, Rebecca. So with all that background, how is AI different from RPA? Unlike RPA, which follows its rules in the same way over time, an AI system trains itself or can be trained, like Rebecca just discussed, to automate more complex and subjective work through pattern recognition. So IBM Deep Blue can learn to be the world's chess champion, and IBM Watson can become the world's Jeopardy champion. Um, next, RPA requires things that are definable, repeatable, and rules-based, while AI can process natural language, unstructured data, and variable inputs. This is a big advantage when dealing with big data that may be coming from a variety of sources in different formats. Similarly, RPA is fixed and can break if the environment changes, whereas AI is designed to respond to changes in the environment and adapt and learn so it can be used in places where a process isn't repetitive enough to trust RPA. Um, similarly, RPA allows you to replace human labor and human tasks, whereas AI may allow you to replace human analysis and human thinking. And finally, the counterweight against all of these generally advantages of AI is that it's typically more time consuming and costly to implement than RPA. So as a result of that, we're currently seeing more RPA than AI as a result of this challenge, although that may change over time. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the trends for adoption and use of RPA and AI. And as Joe mentioned, because RPA is more of a set computer program that you put at the interface level and that can do repeatable and predictable tasks, we're seeing RPA be picked up and used much more frequently, including by technology service providers. But that doesn't mean that AI isn't very fast on its heels. When we look at the rate of AI adoption, and we think about a couple of years ago when we were giving presentations on RPA and AI, the use of AI in, in very practical applications in business seemed very far off. And today, it is not so far off, and it shows you the rapid pace of development of AI. Um, these are just three different sources that show the potential growth of AI and adoption of AI, with Gartner predicting that 46% of CIOs are going to implement AI, but only 4% have actually done so thus far. And Forbes is estimating or showing that machine learning patents grew at a 34% compound annual growth rate over the last five years. And finally, IDC 
predicts that spending on AI and machine learning will grow from $12 billion to nearly $58 billion in 2021. So obviously, this is coming at all of us at a much faster rate of adoption and growth than I think we anticipated a couple of years ago. So I'm going to turn it over to Melanie to talk about what she and we are seeing in use of AI in financial institutions. Melanie? Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Um, so we see many, many uses um, of AI in the financial services sector. Uh, it's a very quick-moving um, issue. Uh, it's hard to keep up with the regulatory uh, uh, ways that there are, or the regulatory application of, of laws to these um, uses, but um, we, there, are, there are several of them um, that are being used now and others in development. So just a couple of examples. First of all, fraud detection is a very common use of AI um, for institutions that have anti-money laundering and similar requirements. Um, AI is used to maximize collection efforts. Joe touched on this before, um, saving human time uh, by using algorithms to identify uh, early delinquencies that are going to be more likely to cure. Uh, AI is obviously used to speed up transactions. One recent example that we've handled here in the office is for an institution that uses AI to predict the likely documentation and other requirements that would be used or required to process a mortgage loan application. Um, by predicting these items in advance, the loan processors can accelerate the process and, and close the transaction more quickly for consumers. Uh, Robo-advisors are another example. They provide investment advice to consumers, usually based on algorithms and the investor's personal information and information about their risk tolerance. Um, you've probably read about um, chatbots, which provide 24-hour 24, 24 customer service um, without human interface. This is really revolutionizing uh, customer service um, in the banking services industry. These chatbots can, can perform services ranging from responding to simple inquiries about account balances to providing more complex services such as investment recommendations and also um, 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 offering products to consumers that may be of interest to them based on the information um, in, in the bank's uh, data. Um, with that, I will – thank you. Um, the other thing that um, institutions can use AI to do is they can use it for lead generation. They're able to leverage large volumes of data that they receive externally or large volumes of their own internal data to most efficiently identify lead targets. Um, and then finally, institutions use AI right now um, to underwrite credit. They can speed the underwriting process by uh, rendering automated decisions on the, on the clear-cut cases, and then they also can use AI to potentially approve ap applicants that wouldn't qualify under traditional credit criteria. So now I will turn the presentation back to Rebecca. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and the current legal constructs. And we're going to focus more on artificial intelligence because it is the greater wild card here. RPA is truly, you know, bits of software code uh, that don't change. They don't um, think and mature and make decisions and uh, continuously change in the same way as AI. So we're going to focus a little bit here on AI and some of the legal and regulatory challenges that we have currently with their use. And it's clear that given the rapid pace of development, our courts are most likely going to be addressing uses of artificial intelligence before our legislators and our regulators will. Um, and I say that just because it has been the trend that technology far outpaces um, the manner in which our legislatures and our regulators can keep up with the development of technology. Now, to be sure, there have been some regulatory responses regarding AI already. We've seen that states have passed legislation regarding autonomous vehicles. 
Um, we see regulatory agencies like the FDA giving approval to artificial intelligence powered diagnostic tools. Um, one in particular was given to a company called IDX for use in diagnosing uh, retinopathy. Um, and it does this by examining pictures of human eyes and making a diagnosis. And what's, what's interesting about this use of technology is it's one of the first that's been approved by the FDA where the, it doesn't require human intervention. There's no doctor checking it. There's no healthcare professional checking it to make the diagnosis. And then last but not least, our own Congress has established the Artificial Intelligence Congressional Caucus. They did this in May of 2017. And the purpose of this caucus is to um, make informed policy decisions regarding the use of artificial intelligence, but also to ensure rapid growth and innovation in the AI industry. But really, despite these early and, and kind of situation-specific reactions to artificial intelligence, our current laws and regulations do not really provide sufficient principles and frameworks for the wide adoption of use uh, and use of AI. And let's look at a couple of examples of how that's true. <clears throat> so, um, we have our friend here on the screen. I'll tell you about him in a minute. But um, as we walk through and look at starting with intellectual property laws, are we able to effectively use those around concepts of artificial intelligence? And we find that patent and copyright laws in the U.S. Um, do not neatly apply to artificial intelligence. Under our U.S. patent laws, it's people who invent things, not companies, and likely not computers. Um, U.S. patent law protects inventors or joint inventors, and it, it currently doesn't offer protection for works created by computer. The patent code says that patentability cannot be negated by the manner in which an invention is made, but it goes on to define the inventor to mean an individual or the individuals who invented or discovered the subject matter of the invention. So we're in the short run, we're not going to be able to rely on patent law to protect intellectual property rights in artificial intelligence that's created. So what about copyright law? Do we, we have a similar problem there? And the answer is yes, we do. The Copyright Office has also stated that it will not register works produced by a machine or mere mechanical process that operates randomly or automatically without any creative input or intervention from a human author. And this concept about humans being the only ones who have protection under copyright laws was somewhat humorously put to, test, put to a test in the monkey selfie case that you all may have heard about. Um, our friend on the screen is named Naruto, and he is a macaque monkey um, who hopefully still resides in Indonesia. Um, uh, Naruto was playing around a camera that had been set up by a wildlife photographer, David Slater, in Indonesia. And David stepped away from the camera. Naruto stepped up to it, started playing with it, and managed to find the shutter button and take some pictures of himself. Um, Slater later came back and published these pictures in a book and was very clear to tell the world that Slater had not taken the photos, but the monkey had taken the photos. Um, well, the people for ethical treatment of animals got a hold of this information and decided that they would try to pursue copyright protection on behalf of Naruto, um, adopting a, um, a friend status as some organizations have been able to do in the past. Uh, for the protection of animal rights. But uh, this case was recently decided on April 23rd in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and that court affirmed the dismissal of claims had, that had been brought by Naruto um, through PETA and held that the animal might have had constitutional standing, but the animal, Naruto, did not have standing to claim copyright infringement. Only humans can enjoy copyright protection, and the Copyright Office has actually gone further and stated that it will not register works created by nature, animals, or plants. So if sentient beings, beings like this guy can't get <laughs> copyright protection, it stands to reason that non-sentient beings uh, like machines that are creating artificial intelligence and neural networks probably aren't going to have 
copyrightable um, interests as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe, who's going to look at a few of our other legal constructs that seem to not apply to artificial intelligence either. Thanks, Rebecca. I was I was looking for some kind of justification to put monkey pictures on this slide last night, and I couldn't find one, unfortunately. <laughs> um, those are great. So aside from IP laws lacking the frameworks and principles for use of AI that Rebecca just discussed, there are many other areas of our current laws that are similarly not suited for application to AI. So first, tort law. Um, think of the foundations of our tort law. Uh, fault, negligence, intent, reasonableness. These are challenging to apply to an algorithm, so our courts may begin to create some law um, through case law, which is what happened in the Ashley Madison data breach case. So Ashley Madison, the, the now defunct website, or maybe it's not defunct, created chatbots to simulate women on their website and drive purchases by men. And the Eastern District of Missouri found that use of chatbots in that manner could be fraudulent and deceptive. So for companies like financial institutions that are using chatbots going forward, even in less colorful contexts, that's something to watch. Second, agency law. In common law and contract law principles, principal and agency relationships usually exist between two individuals. So will laws of agency apply when an autonomous machine or neural network decides what to do? At what point is the scope of the agency fundamentally exceeded or changed by a machine or an algorithm? And then finally, liability constructs. Is AI a product or a service? So software historically has been treated more as a service than a product, with breach of warranty applying rather than concepts of product liability. But when you combine AI with physical products in the Internet of Things, which area of the law will apply? Um, and it's you know, one way to analogize this is that we currently hold people strictly liable when they keep dangerous animals that escape and do harm to the general public. So will we similarly hold the creators of AI strictly liable for damages it causes? Uh, back to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Joe. So as we've just seen, there isn't a lot in our current set of laws and legal principles that are going to help us through allocating risk and responsibility for artificial intelligence, the algorithms that it's using, and the neural networks. Um, and one of the other areas that I think is probably keenly understood to banks and financial institutions is the problem of working within our current regulations when talking about using artificial intelligence and how to comply with current regulations. You know, our regulatory frameworks require transparency, control, and auditability. They're kind of generally built around these principles. And yet, as we've probably all heard about, uh, there's a lot of artificial intelligence that is operating on its own, creating neural networks, making decisions, um, you know, categorizing data, and uh, influencing outcomes without a good explainable trail of how that's happening. And it's very clear for artificial intelligence to be used in regulated situations, and these days most any industry is regulated um, by virtue of privacy laws, but particularly financial institutions and banks, of course, operate under a tremendous amount of regulation. Um, it's going to be important to use artificial intelligence that can satisfy these principles of transparency, control, and auditability. So let's talk a little bit about the need for explainable artificial intelligence. You know, our society is built on a contract of expected behavior, and we will need to design and train our artificial intelligence systems to respect and fit within those social norms and regulatory expectations around transparency, control, and auditability. And just to give a couple of real-world examples of where we're lacking explainable AI and the potential concerns that that can cause, um, there's a, an interesting MIT technology review article where the author states that for many early artificial intelligence systems, there's simply no obvious way to design a system that can explain why it did or why it's doing what it's doing. And he cites, um, NVIDIA's autonomous car test in New Jersey. So NVIDIA taught 
a, a car, a, a car system and an artificial intelligence system within the car taught itself to drive by relying on an algorithm that it created by watching humans drive. And the car's AI system learned, but it's not completely clear how the car is making its decisions. Information goes from the vehicle sensors into a huge network of artificial neurons. Those neurons process and make decisions and then deliver commands to the car. And the result uh, seems to match a human driver, but the system is so complicated that even the engineers who designed it struggle to isolate the reason for any single action or command that the car, that the AI system is giving to the car. So this deep learning is clearly powerful, but this author argues, along with many others, that none of this should occur until we find ways to make it more understandable and accountable to its users. And another similar um, inexplicable, inexplicable deep learning example, we've got Mount Sinai Hospital in New York conducting a deep learning project on 700,000 patient records called Deep Patient. And the results are that the deep patient learning model is far better at predicting disease than traditional methods are. But in this case, um, one of the, the leaders of the project has said, we can build these models, but we just don't know how they work. And so deep patient, for example, is surprisingly good at anticipating psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. And apparently schizophrenia is normally very difficult to predict. But the deep patient team, that being the humans involved in the project, still don't know or understand and they can't explain why deep patient is better at making some of these diagnoses. And obviously, if we knew the decision process behind uh, the deep patient algorithms, uh, we would be a lot more informed and could, could potentially roll out that learning to other parts of the country where they're not running a similar deep patient project. So our government, along with others, are recognizing this problem of making AI transparent. And DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is working on artificial intelligence that can reveal, if not every layer of decision making, at least patterns and key decision criteria. And they call it explainable artificial intelligence, which I think is a term that's going to become more widely used and is definitely going to have relevance with banks and financial institutions. Um, in this case, they're training a computer to find examples from the data set and kind of serve them up as short explanations for why the computer, why the neural network is making the decisions that it's making. Um, so, for example, it can look over a, a set of email and determine whether e determine likelihood that an email might be coming from a terrorist group. And this explainable AI will reveal the patterns, the words, and the different decision components that it's using to make that determination that this set of emails is likely coming from a terrorist group where a different set of emails is likely not coming from that group. So moving on to our next topic, what to do about RPA and AI with your technology service providers. <clears throat> so while the state of our laws and regulations will lag behind these rapid developments of RPA and AI, as your clients begin to build or buy or license RPA and AI, you'll need to default to contract principles as the framework for development, use, and risk allocation, particularly with AI. So first, you'll need to think about how to reform your existing technology service provider agreements. So your existing contracts probably don't have prohibitions on use of AI or RPA or any terms at all regarding AI or RPA because your companies probably weren't even thinking about it during the contracting process. As a result, many outsourced service providers are already implementing RPA and AI and pocketing the savings quietly instead of sharing it with your clients as the customer. So how do you create a dialogue with your providers on how you can benefit from RPA and AI under these existing contracts? And, you know, that's, that's a different answer for each contract. It, it really depends on your contract terms and whether you have contract provisions like benchmarking, rights to insource or resource, or termination for convenience is leveraged to start a conversation with the provider and figure out how to integrate and address these concepts in these existing contracts. 
So moving on to your new outsourced services and technology agreements, you know, the first note is when your procurement team is running some type of new sourcing event, make sure that RPA and AI capabilities are part of the evaluation and selection criteria for the providers. And that may force your company to, be, to start looking at different providers because not all providers are at the vanguard of RPA and AI adoption and finding the right counterparties is going to be key. Also, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but you may find the best solution may involve onshore resources plus some type of automation, either to complement offshore resources or to replace them entirely. Uh, Rebecca? Yes, yeah, so just, just in giving some tips for uh, your procurement organizations and as you look at your existing um, technology service provider relationships, how you might think about reforming them or entering into new ones through use of a, an RFP sourcing event. Um, now we're going to talk about eight contracting principles for you to consider in your artificial intelligence contracting and for you to think about right now. Um, again, as, as Joe emphasized and I want to reemphasize, at the moment when we're talking about building, buying, um, or, or somehow licensing perhaps through a, cl a cloud situation, use of artificial intelligence, we're really going to need to rely on contracting principles in the short term um, rather than being able to rely on existing laws and regulations that will help protect our interests. That will change over time, but in the short term, we really need to focus on contracting. So let's talk about eight different principles that you can think about in this area. One of the first ones, as, as Joe already mentioned at a very high level, is think about machines doing things, not humans. So most of your contracts are written as if people or humans are taking the actions and making the decisions, not machines. And this is a perfect time in your legal departments and your procurement groups and your vendor management functions to pick up your contracts and re-examine those. Um, really look at each individual provision and think about, does this apply equally in the case of a human doing this action versus a machine taking the action? Um, for example, a lot of agreements have a concept of a user. This is particularly the case when you're using SaaS products or you're using on-premise software licenses. Do you need to expand your definition of user to include artificial intelligence or RPA components in your environment? Um, do your software and your SaaS agreements even permit use of RPA and AI versus people or versus the concept of FTEs? So you'll need to consider how to take advantage of cost reductions that are available by your uh, technology service providers using RPA and AI. And you might need to consider replacing things that are done in terms of FTEs with task-based or outcome-based measures as opposed to, um, as we traditionally have seen with so much outsourcing, you know, hiring a group of FTEs to perform particular functions. You also might want to reconsider price escalation provisions because those tend to be labor-based and as we've talked about here, we're going to see an eventual replacement of some components of labor, not all, but some, with RPA and certainly artificial intelligence components. So think about, think like a machine, not like a human when looking at your contract. Next principle, write clear intellectual property ownership and use rules. You may use traditional IP concepts in your contracts but don't assume that they'll cover each and every aspect of AI for some of the reasons we got into earlier. Use clear contractual statements to protect what you need to protect and to own or to have rights in what you need. For example, assignment of copyright interests and in developed materials may leave out entire works developed by AI that are inherently not copyright protectable. Okay, our third principle is incorporate privacy by design and by default concepts into your technology service provider agreements. Um, as many of you are well aware, we recently went through the GDPR tsunami and key data of effectiveness of May 25th. So Europe's general data protection regulation has now taken effect. 
Um, and there will be follow-on regulations developing in other parts of the world. And here in the U.S., it's becoming increasingly important to consider privacy by design and default as well. So in, as you are looking at building, buying, or using artificial intelligence applications, you need to understand the privacy implications of those and try to allocate responsibility for compliance as between you, the financial institution or bank user, and the provider of that technology. So you want to cover data use issues contractually, and you will um, certainly need to know that innovations like AI and predictive modeling are already regulated through frameworks like GDPR, because in, under GDPR, individuals are entitled to know the reasons for certain profiling decisions that are made about them. And if you're using artificial intelligence to make some of those decisions, you're going to need to be able to explain the reasons for those decisions to data subjects who have those rights under European regulation. Um, here in the U.S., Melanie, in her examples of where financial institutions are using artificial intelligence, pointed to some uh, well-known examples already where in this industry we have to make use of reason codes when making credit decisions about individuals um, or other things similar to those that impact um, important decisions being made about individuals. So it's going to be important as you look at using artificial intelligence to understand has it been designed to comply with these privacy principles? Um, have the creators created algorithms that already understand and respect privacy rules around data use and that understand that you're going to have to be able to generate reasons for the decisions being taken? In short, we're really going to have to require the, um, the developers of AI to train the algorithms and the neural networks on these privacy principles and privacy regulations. Next, as we talked about with respect to uh, transparency, control, and auditability and the need for those principles in meeting regulatory requirements, you're going to need to mandate with your technology service providers um, the basis upon which you're going to be able to meet those principles and establish the compliance and trust that's going to be required for use of the artificial intelligence. So, Despite our lack of regulatory principles that are currently adapted to AI, you know, one thing is very sure, the my robot did it defense is not going to hold up very well with respect to your regulators. So in the short term, until we become more sophisticated at teaching AI to explain itself, it's going to be critical to ensure that the AI and the deep learning tools that you're using are capable of being audited and that they present some level of logic and control and that the outcome of these decisions can be explained. That may mean in the short term that you only want to buy and use artificial intelligence that has undergone supervised learning. Remember the cats and dogs examples that we talked about earlier. Supervised learning is the pre-programming of the algorithms into the machine so that it already starts down a predetermined track. Um, versus using unsupervised learning where it's more difficult to understand um, the, the deep learning that's going on in the machine and the outcomes that that produces. So if you can explain the process and the data sets on which the AI is trained, that's going to go a long way toward that transparency principle that we talked about. So uh, next principle, with big data comes big responsibility for cybersecurity. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of the flip side of my earlier observation about RPA, that humans are often the weakest link in cybersecurity. So if you're automating part of your processes and subtracting the humans, you may be increasing security. The flip side of that is that huge data sets are often the fuel for AI, and that creates more opportunities for harmful data breaches and security violations. Um, Machine-generated code and neural networks create the possibility of more areas of attack. And you know, given those risks, it may be necessary from time to time to temporarily stop your neural networks and code generation to run vulnerability scans and penetration tests 
before resuming the organic growth and learning of the artificial intelligence machine, just to make sure that as these uh, algorithms are, are either training themselves or undergoing the supervised learning that um, they're not accidentally building in security flaws that allow access to all of this big data being utilized. Next, determine contractual liability. Three simple words that are anything but simple. And this is really where uh, the challenge in, in the short term in contracting for artificial intelligence is going to exist. So uh, as a user of artificial intelligence, you know, banks and financial institutions are going to need to recognize that it will be nearly impossible to shift all the risk of liability and compliance onto your technology service providers. So you're going to need to plan for a level of control and accountability and oversight um, that is somewhat similar to what you currently do with your technology service providers, but is probably going to have to be amped up in a number of ways um, some of which we've talked about here today, in order to make sure that you can um, you can somewhat control what's going on so that you can then properly allocate the risks when those controls fail. Um, the liability for artificial intelligence and its impact is really going to continue to be one of the most challenging areas for technology and bank lawyers in these early days until the laws and regulations can catch up. And until we have more guidance on that, it's going to be important to do your best to kind of see around the corner of what's coming up ahead with respect to AI to try to implement some of these safety valves that we've talked about, you know, using supervised learning, um, pushing the pause button, as Joe described, to go back and do uh, vulnerability scans and to try to understand you know, with your explainable AI, are you actually getting output that is going to meet the regulatory requirements that you need to meet under our current regulations? So these are all things that you'll have to consider and then uh, attempt to allocate the risk for a failure in one of those areas. And that's going to depend quite a bit on the circumstances under which you are procuring um, from a technology service provider the artificial intelligence. If you are teaming up in some kind of joint development exercise, uh, you being a bank or financial institution with a technology provider to create AI, um, that provider is likely going to push back on your attempt to allocate all compliance risk on the provider of the AI. If, however, you're buying SaaS services um, or turnkey services that have been created by a, a technology service provider, then you might want to peel apart some of the principles that we've talked about during this presentation, understand has the provider taken privacy and security into account? How have they designed this to have um, security in mind? Um, how is it going to meet the principles of transparency, control, and auditability? All these principles we've talked about should be part of your diligence process and then responsibilities around those and maintaining them should find their way into your contractual terms. Next, addressing the human impact, um, especially in regards to labor and employment laws. So obviously, and this is the, the scary elephant in the room for a lot of people, um, AI may create job redundancy. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the glass is half full to this is that um, in a lot of ways we're freeing humans up from some of the scut work in our, our day to day processes in our institutions. Um, but at the end of the day, there may be you know some redundancy, some some people who uh, you know are, are no longer performing functions now performed by AI. So as you consider deploying AI, you'll need to consider the impact on your employees and determine actions that you may need to take regarding that deployment. So. Many countries have employment protection laws, like the Acquired Rights Directive, commonly referred to as ARD in the EU, where actions taken by employers may trigger certain rights of employees. Um, you know, for example, in, in an old school outsourcing with European scope, there there may be rights for your employees to transfer to the service provider. So, you know, th this is a little bit of a different fact pattern than what you're probably used to, and you need to think through, will deployment of AI from a service provider trigger an ARD right for those employees um, that may be impacted? Or may there, might there be worse counsel notification requirements in Europe? Um, 
you know, similarly in the United States, when you deploy AI, if that eliminates the need for jobs at your institutions, is that going to trigger some type of WARN Act notification that you have to give to your employees within a certain time in advance? And obviously, this is uh, something that's, that's come up quite a bit with a number of our clients, and it's something that's top of mind for everybody. If you're using some type of HR tool that relies on AI, like, like screening software, the, the users of that need to be assured that those tools aren't discriminating or containing any type of built-in biases um, from the programmers, the people running the supervised learning, or otherwise. And last but not least in your considerations, um, and perhaps more so than in any other category of technology service provider agreements or services that you may be buying, in the short term until we work out a lot of these unknowns around artificial intelligence, you're going to need a plan B and a plan C. How will you plan for the end of the use of the artificial intelligence or what will happen if you need to press the pause button in order to do some type of compliance or audit check on the artificial intelligence? How will you continue your operations and your business in the interim? Um, so when artificial intelligence deviates from its original intention or it fails to meet the requirements that we've discussed above for privacy or security or transparency, you as a user of the artificial intelligence will need a plan for how can you temporarily or permanently stop it and move away from the use if that becomes necessary, particularly if the artificial intelligence has evolved into an area that's gone beyond the scope that you intended um, or has no longer become explainable in its decision making or has ventured into um, any of these prohibited areas. So. Um, we always, in technology service provider agreements, think about plan for and talk about disengagement services, termination, and a period of moving away. But the difference here is with artificial intelligence, if it has evolved into a prohibited area, you need a faster plan um, that will enable you to continue your business if you find it necessary to take down or to interrupt the artificial intelligence that's operating in your environment. So this is a whole new level of kind of business continuity planning um, that has, has not up to this point, I think, been as important in labor-based or human-based technology service provider arrangements. Melanie? Okay. Uh, yep. Um, so... Just to offer a couple of closing remarks before we um, move on to questions, um, artificial intelligence is obviously already used extensively in financial services, um, and it needs to be addressed in your services agreements from many perspectives, uh, including with regard to the allocation of regulatory risks which are exacerbated in the U.S. in particular by the fact that many consumer financial services laws and regulations were written before any of this AI technology came into being. As lawyers will be challenged in the short term to create frameworks and principles to apply to AI contracting, our courts will begin to provide some of this framework as we wait for our laws and our policymakers to catch up. To successfully manage our AI projects in the short term, it's very important to use the right contractual frameworks and keep up with both the rapid developments of, of AI capabilities as well as the evolution of our financial services regulatory framework. Um, it looks like we have a few minutes left for the Q&A portion of the program. If you have questions, you can submit your questions electronically via the Q&A widget at the bottom, I believe it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as a reminder, if we don't get to your questions during this program, uh, we'll attempt to follow up with you afterwards. So we have a first question that has come in. Um, how have you seen IP ownership rights allocated between the customer and supplier in RPA deals? I, I can grab that one, Melanie. So 
With RPA, during the transition process, you and the service provider will have to collaborate in identifying first what are the in-scope tasks that the, the RPA will be doing and, well, excuse me, what the in-scope tasks are first. Those might be performed by humans or by RPA. And then from there you determine, okay, which of these are repetitive and rules-based enough so that they're good candidates for automating with RPA. And so after you determine what can be automated, the provider should be documenting all of the rules that it uses for automating those tasks through software code. And, you know, realistically, you're probably, as the customer, not going to get ownership rights in that software code, um, nor would it probably be any good to you because these suppliers are probably using their own proprietary, you know, RPA-type software, and you're not getting a post-term license to that. So you're not getting the actual code, but you should at least own the rules that were an input into creating that software code so that you can take those those high-level general rules to the next supplier and then they can program that into their RPA system. Okay, it looks like we have another question. Um, how should financial institutions think about allocating risk and responsibility for compliance with laws when using third-party providers of AI products and services? Very important question. Yeah, that's that difficult. So this is Rebecca. That's that difficult liability question that we talked about earlier. But I, I think in the short run, there are a couple of things that um, banks and financial institutions um, should be doing in their contracts. The first one that I think of is around representations and warranties. So at least at um, and we're talking about artificial intelligence, obviously, that is going to evolve and learn, so the machine learning version of it. Um, so you want to look for um, reps and warranties as to the compliance of the artificial intelligence in its initial form as you're buying it. Um, it, it will change, so at least you know, set a benchmark that at the beginning the provider is willing to tell you that it's been developed to be in compliance with laws and regulations. If they can't tell you that, then I suggest that you're going to need to perform your own assessment of the AI and make sure that at least as you're initially buying it, um, it appears to be in compliance. Um, the next thing you can do is contractually require that the artificial intelligence has been taught and will continue to learn how to comply with applicable laws and regulations. So for example, you know, respecting privacy rights or using acceptable parameters for making credit decisions um, and acceptable predictive criteria for assessing AML risks, for example. Um, these are things that you want to get specific about in your contract with the, the uh, provider. Um, you'll probably want to require that you're buying explainable AI, that category that we talked about where you can essentially get um, what you all refer to as reason codes in another context for the decision making. And then finally, you'll want to require that the artificial intelligence can be audited um, to a sufficient level of detail and so that banks and financial institutions can demonstrate compliance with their regulators. So these are contractual provisions that you'll want to put into the agreement with the provider. And then, of course, will come the question of, okay, if these turn out not to be true and the provider is going to be liable to the bank or financial institution, to what level? And that, of course, is always a tricky negotiation. Um, and because this is such a new area, we don't really have any um, market-based outcomes that we can share on that yet, but stay tuned. This is going to be a, a rapidly evolving area. And last, um, I want to just mention that as um, it's not a point in our slide deck, but I think it's very important for our audience today to understand that these areas are going to require new skill sets within banks and financial institutions. So you are going to need to have people who know data science, deep learning, and understandings of the intersection of artificial intelligence and compliance in order to make use of all of these solutions. Um, of course, all of these areas are in demand right now, but it's going to be very important to staff up with people who understand them so that you can have your compliance people, your lawyers, and your 
um, artificial intelligence technologists all working together on, on your behalf. Okay, we have one more question and then we need to wrap up because we're at the top of the hour. Um, the question is, how are companies using AI in underwriting complying with adverse action notice requirements? Um, so that's a complicated question that probably falls in, into my wheelhouse. The short answer is that they are making sure that they're able to identify the main drivers of um, a credit decline, for example, and then converting those reasons into adverse action codes that are consistent with the codes contemplated in Regulation B um, and ECOA. Um, it becomes a bit more complicated when the decisions are coming from credit reporting agencies and the institution needs to um, comply with the Fair Credit Reporting Act adverse action requirements as well, um, which makes sense in a traditional credit reporting uh, perspective, but can become a bit more complicated when the source of the information um, is not clearly governed by the, by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Okay, so we need to wrap that, wrap up now. Um, Rebecca, I think we wanted to have a quick um, opportunity to say something about our book on this topic. Yeah, I think we need to give our CLIE code one more time, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's 05MB, as in Mayor Brown, 31. 05MB, 31. Um, we just want to mention that we have prepared a, a book that many of you may find helpful or want to share with others in your organization. It covers trends in technology transactions, including digital data outsourcing and software. And um, it's authored by uh, lawyers in our technology transactions practice. So we hope that you will request a copy and find it useful. And to request a copy, you can use the link that's available in the resource list widget. Okay. That wraps up today's program. Um, on behalf of Rebecca and Joe and Mayor Brown, thank you very much for your time. We hope you found our program useful, and please be on the lookout for future invitations for programs on this topic and others that may be of interest to you. Uh, once again, the CLE code 05MB31, a recording to the link of the materials will be distributed by email. Um, be sure that if you're applying for, for CLE credit, um, note that the certificates of attendance will be distributed within 30 days of our program date. So thanks, everybody, for participating. This concludes our webinar.